All right. Hello, and welcome to the Middle East Forums webinar series, Israel Insider with Mr. Ashley Perry. I'm Stacey Roman, and I will be moderating this discussion today. We're pleased to have Mr. Ashley Perry, advisor to the Middle East Forums Israel office, join us here each Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern to update us on all, all the events going on in Israel. Mr. Perry will be giving us a briefing on current Israeli affairs for 10 to 15 minutes and open it up for questions. Should you wish to ask a question, please use the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to get to all questions, but we have many participants on this webinar, so I apologize in advance if we do not get to yours today. And now with no further ado, I'll turn the discussion over to Mr. Ashley Perry. Thank you very much, Stacey, and uh, good evening from Israel. Um, you know, we've spoken about it before, but sometimes Stacey asks me for a blurb uh, of what we're going to talk about sometimes on Saturday or uh, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's always very hard, obviously, to predict what's going to be the following Wednesday. And in Israeli politics, probably harder than most to predict. Uh, but today, I think if, if Stacey would have asked me even last night uh, what we'd be talking about, certainly uh, we wouldn't have understood what happened today because really today was, I think, we wouldn't be overstating it uh, to say that at some point when we are in the post Netanyahu era, we'll look at certain markers along the path to see where things started to decline. And I think today will certainly be a major mark on that. What happened today was relatively extraordinary for those who don't know. And I know the blurb mentioned a lot about coronavirus and we'll get to that because that is also an important element of what's been going on the last week. But today, out of the blue came a major crisis and a resultant major loss for Prime Minister Netanyahu. Basically, uh, a member of the opposition, Bezalel Smotrich, from the uh, right-wing religious party, uh, put up a law which wanted to create a, a Knesset panel, a political panel, uh, for oversight of uh, judges in Israel. Uh, for those who've been following Israeli politics, uh, one of the major sort of uh, cleaves between left and right is this issue of judicial activism, judicial oversight, whereas the right wing wants to clip the wings of the uh, Supreme Court justices especially, and obviously that's something supported by Prime Minister Netanyahu and his people, especially with his ongoing criminal investigations. Uh, for the left, uh, that's certainly uh, a cause's belly, uh, they believe that that's a harm to democracy, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so Basalo Smotrich, a member of the opposition because the Amina party uh, did not join the coalition, and they put up this law, which obviously did not necessarily need the coalition uh, to vote for it, but it basically wanted to create what would essentially be a, a committee to look into whether any justices um, in the Israeli justice system have... Um, any uh, uh, conflict of interest. Now, as many people have pointed out, this is a relatively irrelevant uh, uh, position. But what happened was, is the Likud under uh, Netanyahu's behest decided that they were going to support it and even called on the coalition to support it. Blue and white were absolutely outraged. We know its leader Benny Gantz and most of the party are center, center left. And for them, they've uh, seen uh, this attack on the judiciary as an attack on Israeli democracy. So they immediately jumped into gear. Benny Gantz got on the phone. By the way, Benny Gantz is in isolation because a, apparently a family friend uh, has tested positive, and that means in Israel that you have to go into isolation. But he obviously had some access to the outside world because he immediately called up anyone he could think of. He called up and threatened. This is, this is, this is quite unprecedented. Uh, called up and threatened the two major ultra-Orthodox parties, which have always been the linchpin, the foundation of Netanyahu's governments, and said, if you uh, pass this law, I will no longer have to uphold uh, coalition discipline, and I will vote uh, on issues which you oppose on uh, issues of religion and state. And this action uh, by uh, Netanyahu could very well lead to elections. Uh, this, in turn, led to Arya Derry and Gaffney, uh, a member of the Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox party, getting on the phone to Netanyahu. And apparently, tempers were so frayed, and again, this is extremely unprecedented, Arya Derry apparently screamed at Netanyahu and then hung up the phone on him. He shouted, this is according to a report, and no one has denied this, 
that because of you, we're going to go to elections. Um, in the end, what happened was uh, the vote fell, fell by a margin of 11. It did not pass. And interestingly enough, 13 members of the governing coalition absented themselves from the vote itself, including Netanyahu and most of the very close uh, uh, members of his sort of inner circle in, in the Knesset. So in the end, Netanyahu came down from something he had previously supported vehemently only hours earlier. This is a big win for Benny Gantz. Um, it's a tactical win because at the end of the day, the position still remains the same. But what it really did, I believe more than anything else, is it showed, and this is, this is the word that the Israeli public is using, the Israeli media is using, it showed the disconnect between the political echelons and the public. Because uh, today we are in the heart of what can be easily described as the second wave of coronavirus in Israel. Cases are greater uh, per day than they were even in the first wave, although we are testing in far, far greater numbers. But the fact remains is we are now in some sort of partial lockdown. Many uh, businesses have had to be closed again, uh, places of leisure, uh, places of culture, restaurants are limited to 20 people. And you can imagine many restaurants cannot uh, survive with only being uh, limited to 20 people. So many, many more people, maybe thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands in the coming days, in the coming weeks, are going to find themselves out of employment again. And there's a real crisis going on in the country. And they look at the political echelons and they see what are they arguing about? An issue which even really in the in the calmest of times isn't one that really uh, gets to the heart of most uh, Israeli citizens. But at this point that they're spending time, this is a government, don't forget, that was ostensibly created, this national community government was ostensibly created to deal with the coronavirus and the uh, attendant uh, economic uh, uh, you know, meltdown, let's say. And you know, this is just the latest, you know, it, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe even less than that, a week ago, the Knesset Finance Committee, which is supposed to really deal with these issues, spent a whole day debating how much money they should give to Prime Minister Netanyahu for uh, the manicuring of his lawns in his uh, Caesarea mansion, and how much money, hundreds of thousands of shekels, they should give him uh, in tax relief. And you can imagine that, you know, regardless of where, where someone stands on Netanyahu, that the tone deafness, that this is what the political elections are dealing with. You have that coupled with the fact that uh, a couple of days ago, Mir Regev, the transportation minister, uh, a day after new uh, stipulations, measures have been taken uh, against coronavirus, against this rise of coronavirus, limiting uh, functions and events to 20 people. She held an event for far more than 20 people to open a part of a, a highway uh, in Israel. And the event cost hundreds of thousands of shekels. It had a live band, it had uh, food, it had entertainment. And she even admitted, and you can actually see, uh, she admitted that knowingly there were more people than were supposed to be there. Regardless of whether she broke the rules or not, clearly she did because she admitted it. The fact that we are spending that as a government from the public purse, hundreds of thousands of shekels, an event where people are, are claiming, and, and rightly so, that they don't even know where their next meal is coming from. They don't have a job. They haven't had an income for a few months. It's extremely tone deaf. And even the health minister now, it's just come out that he held an event uh, for his wife, uh, his wife's birthday, when they had far more people than were allowed on the same night where he said that we should look at uh, fighting coronavirus like a war and we all have to be you know, equal in this fight and we all have to uh, do our part. And then it now comes out that he, was, he held an event uh, in, with greater numbers. So what I think this all shows, and I think even we started to see it with the first poll uh, for many, many months, if not years, where Netanyahu's approval rating went below 50%. If a couple of months ago, when we were dealing with the first wave of coronavirus, uh, Netanyahu's uh, approval rating went above 75%, now it's creeped down to below 50%. Now, the numbers of seats uh, hasn't necessarily changed. We can start to see some shift of, uh, of votes uh, from the Likud to uh, parties like Yamina and some others. But that usually takes time. You know, when, when polls are undertaken, it's a snapshot of where people are. And when people say, are you happy with the situation? Are you happy with the leadership? Uh, then they'll vote one way, but then you ask them how they'll vote. And that takes a lot longer to shift because of allegiance, brand recognition, et cetera, et cetera. 
I did say when we started this a few months ago uh, at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, that from my experience working on a number of campaigns around the world, working in politics for you know, almost two decades, when you have crises like this, the first reaction of the public is to rally around the leadership. But as the crisis continues and even gets worse, there is a crisis of confidence in the leadership. And eventually the people start to turn on the leadership. I mean, you're seeing this all over the world, regardless of where it is. We see scenes in Serbia with people trying to charge the parliament because of uh, a, you know, uh, another round of lockdown measures. And you can see it, you know, you don't need me to say which countries, there are many, many countries where there's a massive, massive crisis, confidence of the leadership. And Netanyahu has pretty much been untouchable, invincible for many, many years. I think for today really was the start of something. Uh, again, it may not be tomorrow, it may not be uh, a month from now, it may not even be a year from now, but certainly a level of in invincibility uh, of Prime Minister Netanyahu has certainly been shared today. I think there's a lot of people who are angry about the situation. Um, there's going to be a mass demonstration on Saturday night, they say hundreds of people, hundreds of thousands of people will attend. But most importantly, and this is what I think really needs uh, to be borne in mind, is that the people who are going to suffer most is the base of Netanyahu's support. Netanyahu's support, the Likud traditional support, is the lowest socioeconomic, the Mizrahim, the, the Jews of the Middle East and North Africa, who tend to live more in what's called in Israel the periphery. Um, and these are the people who are suffering. These are the people who are going to suffer because the economic ramifications will be so great. And these are the people who vote Netanyahu again and again. So I think that uh, something is, is changing. Um, and I think, you know, they're, they're trying very hard to, to uh, you know, help the situation. Finance minister has said, and the prime minister said, I think it was yesterday, Within 48 hours, we're going to put together a very comprehensive financial package for all those uh, self-employed, small business owners, et cetera, et cetera. Well, now it seems that they go to need more than 48 hours. So the public are asking, why do you need more than 48 hours when you just spent a whole day debating an issue, which is of absolutely no concern to us. We need to put food on our tables. So I think today was a really watershed moment. Uh, just a little word about coronavirus. We, as I said, we are seeing a massive rise in the cases where Israel was seen during the first wave as a model uh, for how to react and how to close things down and how to you know, flatten the curve, as, as they say. Um, now we are being seen as a model how not to open up uh, as, as quickly as we did. Uh, the head of the health services at the health ministry resigned yesterday. Uh, she claimed that her voice is no longer being listened to that too many people are playing politics with health and the, the reaction to coronavirus. And I think we're seeing a lot more of that. I think there's a real, it, it's, a, it's an extremely, I, I'm not envious of the Prime Minister or anyone in the decision making uh, mechanism because it's a real tightrope. On the one hand, you want to deal with the coronavirus, you want to flatten the curve, you want to save as many lives as possible. On the other hand, you, you need your economy going, you need general life to continue and you need to, to make sure that the people have what they need uh, socially, economically, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a very, very difficult and complicated situation. Um, and perhaps there isn't that much that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu could have done. Perhaps there were certain uh, decisions that could have changed. But what we're certainly seeing is a lot of anger directed at the political echelons in general and the leadership in particular. And with that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. All right, thank you so much. Uh, so you were discussing the financial package. Um, can you give us a little more insight on that? What, what do you think that would look like? Well, some of the hardest hit um, are those who are self-employed and the small business owners, because obviously these are people who don't have massive amounts in their accounts uh, to tie them through a few, uh, you know, a number of months. People who own small falafel shops, for example, small businesses, people who run, you know, from, they, they call it in Israel, you know, ending the month, you know, most, many people, let's say in Israel, I don't know the exact figures, you know, don't have necessarily a, a, a safety net and they live from month to month. So when there's a month or two or three where they haven't been able to make anything or a minimal amount, then, then they go to suffer. So this is where a lot of the anger has been in, Again, going back to the sort of tone deafness, Sakhia Negbi, who is a minister without portfolio, 
said on a very popular uh, TV program last Friday that, and I won't use the word he used because it's a, it's a profanity, but he said it's bleak, uh, that there are people starving and don't have anything to eat. And you can imagine the outrage of that. I mean, the people who absolutely slammed him, you can imagine how quickly he had to apologize and apologize again. Um, and, and again, these are the people who, who are most suffering and, and uh, Israel Katz, who's Israel's finance minister, has put together a package. We don't know yet exactly what will be in it. We do know that one of the suggestions is continuing unemployment until January uh, 2021. Uh, in Israel, you usually get about three months uh, unemployment at about 80% of your earnings. Obviously, there's a cap to it. Um, but that was going to run out in uh, July or August, but now they've said that they will continue that until January 2021. Uh, there's going to probably be uh, another payment given to uh, self-employed and small business owners, again, to maybe tie them through another few months. Um, so these are the sort of uh, uh, things that have been released to the media that they're certainly looking at. But, uh, you know, the, these things change. There's a lot, a lot of uh, difference within the ruling cabinet. You have Nir Barkat, who was promised, if we remember, by Prime Minister Netanyahu to be the next fine, uh, finance minister and then was completely overlooked and today doesn't even chair a committee. He's a, just a general member of Knesset. He has now created uh, 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 his own economic plan and he did the rounds of the uh, morning breakfast shows this morning, tried to tout that as well. And it's basically really a finger in the eye of Yisrael Katz and to a certain extent uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, although Barkat is very careful not to uh, put it that way. Um, so there's really, there's, there's so many mixed ideas and, and mixed messages coming from this government on economic aid and how it will be distributed and when. That's the question. A lot of people are saying these are very nice ideas, but so far we haven't even received a penny of what you promised two, three months ago. So how are we supposed to believe you that in 48 hours we're suddenly going to uh, receive all these payments that we've uh, been promised? Thank you. Uh, should an anger be directed to Derry, and would you like to give a small rundown of his own record with judges? Anger at Derry in so much as, I mean, Derry, uh, Arya Derry, who is the interior minister, the head of the Shas, the Safadi ultra-Orthodox party, has himself uh, was sat in jail for corruption um, and is actually under investigation again, uh, also for corruption. Um, although not, certainly not one of the highest profile uh, cases considering you know, the prime minister is the highest profile at this point. Um, so he certainly doesn't have a clean record on this. But the fact is he was, he, he was one of those also who absented himself from this vote. Um, he uh, understood that for Gads, this was a real causes belly perhaps to drop out of the government or at least not vote uh, with the government, uh, not adhere to, uh, you know, government discipline. Uh, and so it, it, it was Derry, who's a real, you know, who, who, who's such a close ally of Netanyahu, that the election posters had, uh, from Shah's party itself, had uh, Netanyahu on them to show his supporters that when you vote for me, you get the strongest ally of Netanyahu. So for Derry to scream at the prime minister, to hang up the phone, shows how worried he is. He understands Probably at this point, I would argue better than Netanyahu. Derry is a is another one who's a, who's a, again. I'm not going to tell you what I think of him as as a, as, 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 a, as a as a leader, but as a politician, he's he's always really had his finger on the pulse. And the fact that he understands this is not what the people want. We cannot afford to go to another elections shows that at least someone is listening to what's going on. Uh, but he was absolutely exasperated uh, by what he heard, obviously, from the prime minister at this time. So along the lines of uh, going to new another round of elections with uh, Netanyahu's polls being so low or dropping so much, do you think that is a possibility? It's always a possibility. And there's two schools of thought. One uh, that I mostly adhere to that I don't think this is a good time for him because even if elections were called tomorrow, there'd be a three month campaign where the, the financial situation would just get worse and worse. Probably the coronavirus would get worse and worse. And again, maybe we wouldn't see the, the greatest drop in his popularity, but there would certainly be a drop. The other school of thought is, and some say that this actually is believed by Netanyahu and some within his circle, 
that the situation is going to get even worse next year, which is, uh, you know, a, a possible time where he's identified to go to elections to ensure that Benny Gantz does not get to be prime minister according to coalition agreement. And the situation will be much, much worse in 2021. So if we're going to call elections in 2020, he will not do as well, but he, won't, he will certainly do better than he will in a year's time. So there is that school of thought that maybe now is a good time. The other issue, uh, which is certainly still uh, on the agenda and could bring us to elections regardless of who wants or not, is the uh, budget issue. If the budget is not passed in August, automatically we go to new elections. And at the moment, uh, I don't know if I mentioned before, but there was a meeting uh, two nights ago uh, between Gantz and Netanyahu. The main uh, point of disagreement is whether we should have and according to the coalition agreement, a two-year budget, <clears throat> which is something that was brought into the system a number of years ago to promote financial stability. Um, but Netanyahu now wants, and he has quite a lot of support from financial institutions, to have a one-year budget because we don't know what will be in a year because of the coronavirus and its effects. So he's calling for a one-year budget. Gantz, rightly so, is thinking to himself, if we have a one-year budget, in, in Israel, there's this basic principle that if the budget isn't passed within a certain amount of time, we automatically go for elections. So this would allow Netanyahu to get out of his agreement with Gantz without then handing over the reins to Gantz. And that could be a mark on the road for Netanyahu to have a get out of jail free and claim it wasn't his fault and he doesn't have to give the prime minister the keys over to Gantz. So that's what Gantz is extremely worried about. And they try to come up with some clever solution, innovative solution to try and square that circle of how they can have a one-year budget but not give uh, Netanyahu this excuse to break up and go to elections. Uh, but apparently it ended with just mutual recriminations, uh, disagreements, and absolutely nothing uh, moved forward from that uh, meeting. So I, I still don't believe the elections are close, but it could happen, as I said a couple of weeks ago. There is this concept in Israeli politics that I've always talked about uh, that sort of the more elections are talked about, everyone starts jockeying for their positions uh, politically. And when that happens, it doesn't take much, a relatively small trigger then to bring us into elections. It's certainly something the public does not want. But again, political uh, considerations are not necessarily always in line with what the public wants. Mm. Is there any checks and balances on the powers of different branches of government in Israel, like in America? There are, but they are different. Uh, each country has their own different balance. Uh, in Israel, the executive uh, sits in the legislature as opposed to the states where members of the government uh, will not also sit in Congress. In Israel, uh, members of the government will also be members of Knesset. Now, we've seen recently uh, passing a law where you can actually remove yourself from the legislature, from the Knesset. Uh, but on the whole, Prime Minister Netanyahu is the head of the executive, and he's also a member of the legislature. Um, as opposed to the US where uh, members of the judiciary are appointed uh, politically, uh, in Israel they're not. They're usually appointed internally. There are members uh, political members of committees uh, who, can, who will appoint the, the justices, but usually the justices themselves have a majority. So there is that, uh, there is that uh, offense between the judicial level and the political level. Now, a lot of politicians, especially on the right, want to remove that and allow the politicians, similar to the system in America, to have far more say on who will sit on the benches. Uh, and we've certainly seen an, a, a an attempt to erase that fence, uh, but it still remains largely. Um, so that, those, those are the checks and balances uh, in Israel, different uh, to the US, but uh, it is an issue in Israel, this tension between the branches, uh, especially the judiciary and the political level. And it's one that's not gonna go away anytime soon. Thank you for explaining that. Um, so we do have quite a few questions coming in about annexation, so to lead into that, do these events of today have any implications for the anticipated annexation? Well, I think the word you used there, anticipated, very few Israelis are anticipating it. If last week, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke about it being so far down the list of priorities, 
Today, it's probably even further down. And I think even at the political level, it has barely been mentioned uh, in days here. Uh, every now and again, we get a little bit of information that the US uh, administration is maybe going to make an announcement this week. Um, and certainly the, the clock is ticking because if it's going to happen, it will, ha will have to happen relatively soon. That's what many commentators are assuming before the US gets into a, the middle or really the heart of the election cycle. Um, and bas but basically it's really, it's, it's not been on the agenda at the moment. I mean, no one has said that it's off the agenda, but it's certainly with all these other things, coronavirus and the economic uh, situation, it's so far down the priorities of the average uh, Israeli. And I would say even today, it's almost off the political agenda. Obviously that can change in a moment if they get the green light from the US. Uh, perhaps it would even be a good distraction or deflection uh, from Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, but again, it, in the midst of so much anger and so much focus on what's going on, I think it would be very difficult for Prime Minister Netanyahu to suddenly sell this uh, and come out well from it. Thank you for that. Um, what is the outlook on U.S. tourists being able to get to Israel? Is it a realistic is it realistic to plan a tour for 2021 or 2022? I'm sure that's probably difficult to predict at this moment, but is there any way for us to contribute to the sector's economic recovery? I mean, I, I hope by 2022, I hope by 2021, we will, the world will be open up. I mean, to have two years where we just basically close our borders would be unthinkable. I mean, it would be the death knell for our economy, as you can imagine. Um, you know, there was talk uh, a few months ago when things were going well in Israel that will start in August, opening up to some uh, countries uh, close by, or actually even further away, who also were fighting the coronavirus pretty well. Greece, Cyprus, at the time Australia, New Zealand. Well, none of these countries want anything to do with Israel at the moment because our coronavirus numbers are through the roof, uh, as it were. So we are not going to open up this summer. I, I certainly wouldn't be anyone who's thinking of booking a trip this summer or even the Jewish high holidays, which begin September, October after that. I wouldn't put, I personally wouldn't be uh, spending too much money uh, banking on being able to come. Unfortunately, uh, non-Israeli citizens are not allowed to come into Israel with very few exceptions. Um, if there's this, they, 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 you know, even before the second wave, they were talking about a major wave around the high holidays with the flu season coming. With the high holidays, we can imagine a lot of people want to be with family, a lot of people will be praying together. You know, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are the, let's say, the, the few days on the Jewish calendar where even less religious people go to synagogue. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, there's going to be a lot of pressure, there's going to be a lot of uh, sort of um, uh, communal meeting around that. And with the flu season just on the doorstep after that, that's when really a lot of people thought the second wave would come. So it's come very, very prematurely. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in this. I, if someone tells me by 2022 we'll still be locked out from the world, I think that would be very, very unlikely. And I, every, like everywhere, everyone's just waiting for a vaccine or some strong antivirals or a situation where we can begin to travel again. So it's not just Israel who's in this situation. Israel's taken extreme measures to shut their borders. Um, but like everywhere in the world, we're just waiting for those things to happen and then hopefully we can get back to some semblance of normal. So correct me if I'm wrong, I heard you say that the health minister stepped down. How will that affect uh, the effort against coronavirus? No, uh, I mean, there's a new health minister. There was a previous health minister who did step down. He decided to take up a position as, a, as housing minister. Uh, um, but the new health minister, Yuli Edelstein, who was previously Speaker of the Knesset, uh, has only been in the position a few weeks. Uh, as I said, I think you know, he's, he's, he's got a lot of goodwill. People like him. Uh, this report that was released that he, you know, his wife's birthday was attended by dozens of people on the day where he was telling the whole country to stop congregating, certainly, again, is, is, is a very bad message, if true. He's, he's denied it to a certain extent. He's left a little bit, uh, a, 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 a little bit vague. Uh, but no, we have, we have a relatively new uh, health minister. And actually, I think so far, uh, the reports coming from uh, his office are pretty good. Again, we had a major figure within the health ministry who resigned. Uh, but I think our argument was more with the, um, the professional level. Uh, 
the disagreements and the arguments and the pettiness and the uh, politics involved at that level, which she said she just wasn't being listened to anymore. So she decided to resign. Understood. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, unfortunately, we have come to the close of our webinar today. Mr. Perry, thank you again for taking time to update us this week. Uh, please be sure to tune in next week to see what will unfold. On Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern, we'll have Barack Bechtel here discussing Turkey's dangerous Ottoman nostalgia. Thank you all again for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day.